Okay, let's go ahead and uh, begin the formal presentation then. So again, to those of you who just joined us, uh, thank you for joining us for this presentation of Telehealth and Teleaudiology Service Delivery Models, again, brought to you by Odometrics, a division of Natus. I'm going to go ahead and start the, uh, the formal presentation here and then uh, give you a brief intro, and then I'll turn you over to our featured presenter for the day. So, like I said at the very beginning, um, you can see my picture there on the right. My name is Brianna Young. I'm an audiologist, and uh, I work uh, with Odometrics for the last few years. And most recently, I am the current uh, Global Hearing Assessment Product Manager. So my portfolio is uh, the Madsen products, so the Astera 2, Capella 2, the uh, brand new Zodiac, and a variety of other products that fall underneath that line. And it is my pleasure to introduce our featured presenter for today. Um, it's Jeanette Fitzke. She's also an audiologist and from the US uh, organization. And she is currently um, with us as the field clinical audiologist team lead. So um, she has uh, been doing that for quite a while now. Is, and I'm very excited to hear her speak on telehealth and audiology as she has uh, quite a bit of experience on that. A bit of housekeeping before we move on. Of course, at the bottom, you can see the link where you can access upcoming webinars, um, as well as webinars that have previously been recorded that you can view on demand at any time for free. So uh, you can go ahead and check that out. And uh, of course, I'll give my contact information at the end of the presentation if you have any uh, questions or concerns. A few tips and tricks while we're working here together today. Um, if you might have noticed, all of your microphones have been muted, and that's just to reduce background noise. We are actually recording this session, and it will be available on demand in about a week or so on our um, Odometrics website. So your microphones have been muted. So if you have a question, um, please use the question box in your webinar bar menu. And I'll collect all of those questions, and once the presentation has concluded, I'll then relay those on to Jeanette to answer um, once the formal part of the session is done. Um, I'll also, like I said, include my email at the end, so if you think of something um, a few minutes after the webinar is done, or maybe you think of something in a week or two, you can always reach out to me and I can pass along the question to Jeanette or to, um, or to whoever else might be applicable to answer that for you. If at any time during the webinar you experience any technical difficulties or you need immediate assistance, um, you can write a message to me directly uh, via the um, webinar uh, bar menu that you see on your screen. And then, of course, my name again is Brianna Young. So without further ado, I'd like to turn uh, the stage over to Jeanette. So I'm just going to share the screen with her. She's currently in uh, Oklahoma in the U.S., I believe, so we might take just a moment for it to go to Chicago, to Oklahoma, and then um, we can let her start the presentation. So go ahead, Jeanette, and uh, take us away. All right. Thank you so much, Brianna, and thank you, everyone else, for joining us today. Um, just get going here. Can everyone see my screen okay? Good uh, to go? Yep. Jeanette, looks like we're good to go. All right. Fantastic. Thank you. All right, so as uh, Brianna said, we're going to be talking about telehealth and teleaudiology today and kind of how we do it, what it is, and kind of the reasons behind it. Um, so there's just a little focus on the agenda there, so you can kind of see that as an overview. So basically just jumping right into it, what are some of the reasons we've kind of moved to telehealth in general? So some of the patient considerations is we do have an aging population, also trying to improve patient care. And then what are the clinic's goals and objectives with that for the patient? So if you look at this slide here, this kind of gives you an overview here of what's happened to our population. Started with a much younger group, and then as you know, healthcare has improved, mortality rate has improved, you can see there as we're going through the different decades, the growth in the older population, especially looking at those that are 65 and above. So if you look there in the projections by 2050, um, to increase over time. Then as we move on, not only are patients getting older, but also where do they live? Are they in locations that are easily accessible to healthcare, or are they in more remote rural areas? So if you look at this slide here, you're gonna see 
we look at the rural growth, there's actually more of our older adults living in a kind of rural setting, which is on the outskirts of towns versus in the urban areas where you've got much easier access to higher level physicians or, or higher level specialists to receive more specialized care. So why is that concerning? Because as our patients get older, driving can also become riskier and more of a concern. So if you look at here, um, if you look at you know just younger versus older drivers, if they're on the road and are having um, more likely, a, sorry, I'm just trying to move some of this out of the way so I can see the slide here. So if you look here, their relative probability to actually have a fatal injury when involved in that uh, automobile accident is going to increase versus the younger drivers at a statistically just outstanding rate. So if we have our patients in those more remote and rural areas and then they're on the road driving and exposed to more likelihood of being involved in that crash, that if they are involved in that crash, they're more likely to be fatally injured from that. So that's a you know definite concern, and we want to try to decrease the amount of time they may be on the road. So also with our older patients, they have a higher risk to fall. So as they do have a higher risk to fall, they also have a higher risk to be involved in a crash. So if we look here, um, we can see that 12 million older adults will experience a fall this year, and of those, 400,000 will be involved in some type of crash. So if, back to the previous slide, also being involved in that crash, also having a likelihood for a higher fatal injury from that, um, we definitely wanna to try to avoid that for our older adults. So aside from some of the risks with our older patient population, we also wanna improve our patient care. So when you look at some of the initiatives around telehealth, we wanna not only reduce that burden of driving those long distances to seek those uh, telehealth care and specifically for us with audiology. Um, we also want to reduce the cost. I mean, it costs a lot, you know, gas prices and things like that, and also the risks to them. But we also want to increase their access to hearing loss care, vestibular care, hearing aid fitting care um, in part of that. So what are some of the other goals associated around that? So if we look here, this was a 2018 U.S. telemedicine industry benchmark survey. And what it was asking organizations was, what are your priorities with telehealth? Um, where does it rank in your facility as far as a priority? And where does it possibly kind of fall short? So if you look at this slide here, if you look at a high priority and one of the top priorities, when they talked to different organizations, 70% of the organizations actually said it was a higher or top priority versus only 30% really not placing much emphasis. So kind of considering this, we can really see that it's transitioning to becoming more part of most organizations' day-to-day -day thoughts and objectives. So here, what we're looking at here is really looking at the success of the programs so if you look at the, you know, kind of the top ones, those were the ones that ranked as a top and a high priority. And the dark blue are the ones that are highly successful in the program, and the light blue is only moderately successful, whereas the green was an unsuccessful program. So you can see the correlation between those that ranked as a top and a high priority are more successful. So really what it's saying in this slide is that we really need to get the buy-in from the organization to actually have the success of the program. If you're really not buying into it, it's gonna be really hard for your staff, your administration to really put that time and the effort into what needs to be done for the program because it is you know, some legwork to get it up and running and you really gotta have that dedicated staff and administration to get that accomplished. Where in the contrast, if you look at the bottom, those who really didn't put a lot of emphasis and priority into it are going to be much less successful than those who are really kind of taking that drive to make it succeed. Here are looking at some of the objectives with the programs. And if you really look at the top, the ones that, again, are higher priority objectives versus the lower um, objectives are going to be really ones that are focused around the patient. So yeah, there are administrative goals and costs to that as well, 
But if you look at those first few top options, it's really staying focused around the patient care, improving the patient outcomes, improving access to patients that are more remote, keeping the patients engaged and involved in their health care, and keeping the care convenient to the patient. Whereas you look down at the bottom, where it's really getting more into cost and administrative issues, those are much lower overall priorities. So like improving EMR access, electronic medical records, increasing revenue, um, kind of branding of the practice, those are going to be lower on the scale. When we're really looking at our overall objectives, it's really still making the patient the priority. So what are some business drivers for you to consider telehealth and teleaudiology in your own practice? There are financial drivers, but there's also some changes happening in audiology, and that does kind of really relate to the supply and demand of our services and our providers. So if you look here, these are some of the primary contributors, and this really replicates back to that slide we just recently saw on those same things about patient care, patient satisfaction, um, but also reimbursement. So with this, some of this is going to depend on where you are in the world, on how telehealth is viewed or licensure laws, and how you can be reimbursed depending on where you are. Um, so some of that will vary depending on location, but also really is about keeping that patient with our practice. Because if we have patients that are going away from us, we're going to lose the ability to really control their care. So as we think about some of the kind of changes that are help happening in our audiology world, over the counter in the US is you know, kind of hitting the forefront here. We want a way to keep that patient loyal to our clinic and keep being the ones to provide their health care. Some other things to think is, you know, we've got you know, changes in staffing needs, burden costs associated with that. Um, we also want to have more productive use of our time. Maybe we want to share some of the costs across other specialties, but also maybe to reach our patients that are more remote, um, and then also combat some of the outside competition that we have in our locations. Our patients are also changing. Our patients are on the internet. They are involved in their health care. So we want to make sure that we're giving them access to care wherever they are, or even in their home or at work to make it easier for them to get the care that they need. Also, us as audiologists, um, you know, we get older, we retire, we move on. So you can see here, this was a study back in 2013, kind of looking at where audiology is going to be over the next 30 years. And what they're noting is that the number of audiologists is going to, the need for it is going to grow by 50%. And with that, audiologists are going to move on, either uh, choose to move on to another profession or choose to retire. So if we kind of look at the demand of we need to rise by 50%, but we're also going to lose 20% of our workforce, where is the lag going to come into? We're not going to have the amount of audiologists that we need to service this aging and growing population, especially those over the age of 65. So we need to have a more creative way to reach more patients. Um, also, maybe consider using supplemental providers like audiology assistants to help in our care, kind of take over some of the tasks that maybe don't always require an audiologist. So basically, when we're looking at this, we may have to also look at ways to expand what we can provide. So if we are able to have assistants take over some of our roles, then maybe we can start to provide some of the higher level scope of practice maybe move into doing some other services like vestibular, tinnitus care, um, also just intraoperative monitoring or other things um, that may help to grow the field of audiology for our patients beyond just basic care. So kind of summing that up, um, looking at some of the benefits, really is improving access to care. And in the U.S., we have our VA population who's really focused and embraced telehealth, and they've shown the ability to reduce wait times uh, with that improved access of care. Also, bringing access to clinicians that may have been four plus hours away sometimes. Also, getting better access to patients in those remote and rural areas. Also, just cost efficiencies not only to the patient with the reduced travel times, but also to the clinicians who may have had to drive to some of those facilities before. 
and then being able to share staffing. So at a lot of these clinics, they'll not only do teleaudiology, but they'll also do other telehealth services throughout the day. So they're also being able to be used for other specialties of care. Also improving the quality of care, meaning they're getting consistent care remotely, even as they would with a face-to-face -face visit with that provider. And then also just the patient demand, the patient is preferring to use that because they're saving time away from their family, their work, and other activities. And then just increasing that operational efficiency by utilizing employees to handle some of the things that an audiologist may not need to handle. So we've been throwing around the term telehealth, teleaudiology, what is it, how do we do it? Um, a lot of loosely used terminology. So really when you look at telehealth, telehealth um, is really just trying to deliver that healthcare and that medicine through a different remote channel. So that can be done through the internet, it can be done through telephone media, it can be done through email, um, it can be done through a wireless or a wired connection, but it's basically taking healthcare and providing it at a distance. Now again, state law will kind of determine who and where and how that can be delivered. Um, other ways is using a a phone, an iPad, using apps. Some of you may even have some of these apps on your phones to use yourself for things that aren't related to teleaudiology, but maybe just around telehealth, like monitoring your heart rate, um, your blood pressure, sharing that information with your provider if you're on a management plan. And then when we refer to teleaudiology, it's taking the tele, it's taking the same telehealth model, but now applying it to doing audiological services. So what are the modes of telehealth? When we're talking about telehealth, there's really different ways that those can be delivered. Um, and that's really depending on where and how the provider is communicating with the patient. So if we look at the first model, asynchronous and store and forward is something that's been being done for a longer period of time. So store and forward is where a service is completed. Maybe you go to get an x-ray done. And then later on, the clinician is going to read that through another application, maybe a web base, logging onto a system, and then recalling that x-ray or other data for later review, or labs are another very common one that are done through that. And then sharing later on the results of that through email or text messaging. So basically, the provider and the uh, patient aren't having live communication and contact during the actual exam. So it's just you know kind of being recalled for later kind of review and use. So most of the time when you're getting those types of services done, it's not the actual provider that's there. It's going to be like a lab assistant or a radiology assistant that's going to collect that data for accuracy to share later with that clinician. Where in contrast, when we're looking at synchronous type of mode of delivery, we're actually having live real communication with our provider. And that can be done um, through an internet access where the clinician is logged in at their site and then the patient is at a site where there's support personnel working with the patient directly to make sure that the patient is set up to have real-time live conversation, communication with the provider. So this can be done just for a casual conversation um, such as maybe like a psychiatry visit where they're just having lifetime talk and communication, or in the realm of audiology where you could actually be doing a hearing test and be able to talk to the patient as you're providing that testing. And then when concluded with the test, you can actually discuss the results with them and have a counseling session. So you're going to be able to ask that provider any questions that you need at any time because you have that contact with them. You can also do a combination of the two, where you're using a com combination of that store and forward and that live communication. Also, we have our mobile health. So this is where you're saying you may have some apps to kind of monitor your chronic conditions over time. So like I said, that could be where you're monitoring your heart rate, your blood pressure. If you're diabetic, maybe monitoring your blood glucose levels and then your provider can you know, get that information off your apps and be shared. Um, this can be in real time, or this can be in that asynchronous store and forward type of message. 
And with this, you will need to have access to a mobile phone or an iPad so that you can have this communication. And when we think of audiology, this is currently being done with vestibular therapy. So if a patient is getting rehab, they actually have questionnaires and assessments to kind of let the provider note their progress as they're doing home exercises. Also with hearing aid adaptation, um, there's now apps to monitor that and share with the provider, as well as now some remote login um, for the provider to make adjustments. And then also with tinnitus therapy, again, with questionnaires and other things that the provider can access and use. Then we also have our traveling model. So this is where we actually take the audiology clinic and now put it in a some type of traveling vehicle. So with this, services are gonna be provided by a licensed professional. And in the case of audiology, it's gonna be an audiologist. The equipment gets stalled and mounted in the vehicle so that it's secure during traveling. Um, and also to be aware, some states, if you are gonna be driving this around, you may need to get your commercial driver license. So just be aware of that in the state that you're in. Most often you'll see this used in audiology with occupational health to do healthcare monitoring um, with different facilities on the hearing, um, just to make sure that we're not seeing changes in that patient's hearing over time. Or even with VA and some universities have used it to get access to care in some of those remote areas where they could do screening programs and monitor patients that are not necessarily close to the clinics. Currently, there aren't any um, clinics that I know of that are using it with vestibular care. It's been mo more focused around doing diagnostic and hearing aid services in this traveling kind of model. So what do you need to get started with this? So if you were to consider doing this, it'll depend on kind of if you wanna use the asynchronous or the store and forward approach, um, but there is some basic non-audiology equipment that you'll need. You're gonna need a computer, you also need a codec to you know, share and forward the information. You will need an internet connection. And depending on where you are, if you're in a remote location, it may be better to be wired versus wireless to get that you know, steady signal. If you wanna be able to do live communication, you will need video conferencing so that the patient can see you and you can see the patient. You will need to have some type of software if you wanna take over the computer screen. So, Link, uh, Skype, log me in. These are all possible software options. And then you'll need some kind of area to mount the equipment. So you can put it on a cart that you see in the example here, or you can you know, make a wall unit, desktop area, whatever works in your clinic space. If it is going to be a room that you may want to use for other services, that's where the cart can really be helpful because then you can move the cart out of the way if you're going to use the room for other things throughout the day. Um, some of the general audiology equipment considerations, if you wanna do hearing testing, you would need an audiometer, and you would wanna have an audiometer that can provide tone, speech, and also have the ability to monitor room noise um, with our fitting equipment if you're gonna be doing testing outside of a booth. Um, also, if you wanna do any admittance testing, you would need an admittance device, and then if you wanna do any kind of verification or electroacoustic analysis of the hearing aids, you would need fitting and verification. So you'll see there in this slide here, it's just showing examples of otometrics equipment to be used in that application. And then the cart that you actually see there on the right-hand side is a cart that is in use in facilities today. And we partner with Global Med who puts that cart together and Ironbow to help with that. So. The products on there as far as audiology are ours, but the other video conferencing are provided through Global Med, who's one of our partners. So when you're considering kind of establishing your own clinic, you really want to determine what your goals are. What's the scope of care that you want to provide? Do you want to be more of a screening kind of approach or do you want to have a full-fledged diagnostic service? How do you want to deliver that care? Do you want to do it synchronous versus asynchronous? Do you want to do a traveling clinic? What is the audiology and the telecommunication equipment cost? What kind of IT support do I have to connect between my facilities? You really wanna have buy-in from your IT department because if they're not on board with helping you, it's gonna be a much longer road to get that kind of set up and established. 
Also, if you're in private practice, you might want to do a business plan market analysis to see how that could help your practice grow. Also, you're going to have to decide who do you want to help to kind of be the extension of you, the hands of you, if you are providing these services in other areas. So usually nurses or audiology assistants are going to be great staff to start with. And then finally, you know, depending on where you are in the world, what are the licensure requirements um, as far as how and when you can deliver that care. So when you're thinking of your support personnel, you really want to think of somebody who's going to be comfortable with the patient, with handling them in a medical capacity. So that's why I said, you know, a nurse is a really good um, clinician to start with if you don't have an audiology assistant because they're already going to be comfortable handling the patient's medical needs. Also, depending on other services, if they need to do some basic, you know, vital signs assessments, they're going to be comfortable with grabbing that information as well. Um, other things is to have somebody that's comfortable with technology because they are going to be handling the computer, handling, you know, handing that session over to you. So you want to make sure that they're really comfortable with handling that and helping to troubleshoot if issues arise because we all know computers are computers and there's things that can happen. So you just want to have somebody that's really flexible and ready to help in those kinds of situations. Also, again, this does come back to licensure. Um, most states don't have regulations on the support personnel. So you would just want to double check that though as well. So this again will depend on where you're located, but when you're looking at the areas of regulation and the laws, a lot of it has to do with where and how the services can be provided, how they define telehealth and telemedicine, and then what are the reimbursement guidelines. They do vary sometimes for private insurances versus those that are receiving like state-assisted Medicaid care and then Medicare services. So those are all things to investigate um, with that. These are some of the sites that you can check. So if you are US-based, you can look at this as the Center for Connected Health Policy will update what the laws are in your state and what your reimbursement guidelines are and the delivery of telehealth care. So where are we at with teleaudiology today? What we're currently seeing provided is tinnitus care, vestibular rehab assessment and follow-up, also, for those of you that are dispensing hearing aids, you may have started to get into some of the remote applications with your patients where you start to provide remote programming care. Um, it is with our government services, with VA telehealth and some of our active duty. Also, cochlear implant mapping. And then also even doing some um, newborn hearing care with some of the store and forward options. Where can we kind of think of the future, what we can do with telehealth? Doing vestibular screening for sports concussions, traumatic brain injuries. So if we think about people that are out in the field exposed to dangerous conditions, then we could actually be able to provide some kind of screening for them without them having to come to a more specialized clinic. Also, digital ear scanning is something new that we have as well maybe being able to provide a scan of the ear remotely so that hearing custom devices can be uh, ordered. And then also screening in the ER for vestibular pathology versus a stroke. And being able to have a provider look at that information and really kind of dictate what that next step of care is. So a lot of growth opportunities with telehealth as well. Um, so I have put some references here. So if you do need access to some of this information, we can provide some of this to you after. Just email Brianna and let her know. So I wanna thank everyone for their time today. I know it was kind of just a brief overview, kind of to get you exposed to what are some of the things to think about. And if you have more in-depth questions, please reach out to us, let us know, and Brianna will take it over from here. Thank you, everybody. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Jeanette, for uh, for your time and your energy in this really wonderful presentation. I did give Jeanette a bit of a, a large task when we approached her to present because this is originally, I believe, what an hour presentation, Jeanette, and so uh, yeah. <laughs> and so I'm trying to get it down in the succinct and um, 
comprehensive way for a half hour um, is a challenge. So thank you, Jeanette, for your time and energy and, um, and for participating today. Thank you. So, and oh, I do apologize. My email address is not on this slide like I said it would be. So um, if you have any other questions, as Jeanette said, and um, I don't believe we've had any yet, so we'll, we'll stay on the line here while I finish just wrapping up the presentation. So please use the question box to send me something. Or if, like you said, you need to uh, think about the presentation or you um, all of a sudden you wake up in the middle of the night this week and you think of one, you can email me at um, brianna.young, so it's my first name, dot last name, at natus, N-A-T-U-S, dot com. So again, that's brianna.young at natus.com. So if we don't have any other uh, questions or concerns, I think we'll go ahead and wrap it up for today. Um, last friendly reminder, if you have a colleague that maybe missed today's presentation or you'd like to view our previous presentations, you can check out that link at the bottom of the screen there, odometrics.com slash webinars, and you can view all of our previously recorded um, previously recorded sessions it includes um, a lot of vestibular sessions, um, workflow in particular. Um, there's a pediatric admittance one that we just did last month. So check that out. Um, email me questions at brianna.young at natus.com. And again, thank you so much for participating. Have a wonderful rest of the day, everyone.